What's the biggest shift happening on Earth right now? I think it's that one species has suddenly developed the ability to alter the entire planet. Inventions in technology are at once tremendously exciting and completely terrifying. On the one hand, we have the opportunity to come together and create unprecedented global human thriving. We, humanity, now have the potential to design our own evolution. This has never happened before. But on the other hand, humans have started an exponential trajectory over the last hundred years that's still accelerating of increased carbon emissions, temperature, species extinction, and other key variables. Even conservative estimates show business as usual leading to rampant natural disasters, widespread food insecurity as soon as 2050, and a far more desolate world for our descendants. Many seem to assume that problems like climate change are indeed problems, but somehow we'll turn it around. Surely we won't just drive the bus off a cliff. In this talk, we'll look at a plan for that somehow. I believe world problems stem from a confusion about that who we are and that what is required is a radical shift in consciousness. The shift from me to we. A recognition at least by the world's influencers, technologists, and leaders that we are one team. Today we'll look at two big ideas that motivate this shift. Interconnectedness and universal love. Now these are often relegated to the realm of spirituality or seen as abstract platitudes, but today we'll look at how they can be applied to a pragmatic understanding and repurposing of business, technology, and other global human systems. This shift is essential not only for our species to survive and thrive, but also rather conveniently for individual human happiness. And we can achieve it. Global problems like climate change make us feel powerless, and ultimately, each of us in isolation is powerless. But together, we are powerful. Let me tell you a little about how I got to this perspective. I think it can be helpful when we share our journeys with each other. So when I was 10, I got my first computer, and I was immediately fascinated by this magical little box. I would start learning how to program, and I would make little games that I'd give out to friends on floppy disks. It was my first taste of the thrill of leverage. I, I could write code once, but then give it as a gift to as many other kids as I wanted to. And as I grew up, I wanted to give bigger gifts to more people. And so out of college, I worked at Google, where I wanted to help people communicate, so I wrote the first prototype of Google Chat. I wanted to help people collaborate, so I contributed to early versions of Google Drive. After Google, I went to Facebook, where I led the development of Facebook pages, and probably my best known work, the like button. <laughs> Currently, I work on Asana, a company I started with Facebook's co-founder, Dustin Moskovitz, based on our experience building Facebook's internal communication tools. Asana builds software that helps groups of people coordinate their collective action, sort of like email, but better. It's an organizational backbone for some of the world's greatest rising companies, and for us, it's a labor of love. There's something else I've been fascinated by since I was a kid, and that is the universe. I think the, be the best summary I could give of my life is, I was born, and I was really impressed. <laughs> I mean, there is no reason there should be a universe at all, let alone me as this sentient little being tooling around in it, interacting with other little sentient beings. I love the universe. <laughs> I am determined to never take this improbable gift for granted. I want to explore life, understand it, live it to the fullest. And this has led me to become a student of meditation and spirituality. Spirituality is this horribly overloaded word, and I'm anything but religious, so I'm as surprised as anyone to be up here talking about spirituality. But I use the term here to mean the study of the nature of reality and consciousness through direct experience. So once you get past some of the Sanskrit jargon and mystical mumbo jumbo, I think spirituality is really just a set of technologies for gaining insight into what's really going on here. I've studied the great texts of Western and Eastern philosophy, but I wanted to go deeper than the intellect. So for the last four years, I've meditated or practiced yoga most every day and employed other spiritual technologies like ecstatic dance. I also live in an urban co-op with 11 others, experimenting with living authentically and embodying our shared values. 
Sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's beautiful, but it always pushes us to grow. Now, some of this work has been joyful, but some was a real struggle. A couple years ago, I, I took a tent to the woods, and for a week, I, I camped alone. Nothing around for miles but nature, and nothing to do but meditate for 16 hours a day. I went to the woods because I wanted to see what's really going on in here. To really stare myself in the face. We had crazy highs and depressing lows, but I persevered because I wanted to see who I really am when there are no distractions left to take refuge in. Over these years, I've had about two dozen ecstatic, transformative experiences that I think others might have called peak religious experiences. Even with these, none of this gives me any credibility to wisdom. Uh, I don't think any of the things I've done are required to gain the perspective I have. And in fact, each person's journey is necessarily going to be unique to get to know yourself. But these experiences have changed me bit by bit over these years. I've, my heart has just kind of opened up. Before, I spent a lot of time being concerned about what other people thought about me. I was never quite content. I was always felt like something was missing. And these days, I still do. Pretty, pretty much every day. <laughs> pretty much every hour. But now, I can usually just pause for even just a second and find a joy in each breath, a love in each creature. And I focus a lot more on how much I can give than how much I'm receiving. And these two parts of my life, technology and spirituality, are deeply intertwined for me. In fact, this nexus is a growing movement in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. It's discussed very little publicly, but some of the technology industry's most influential people are studying it, impacting the products that hundreds of millions of people use each day. And the heart of this movement is this radical shift in consciousness from me to we. The shift from identifying with our individual minds and bodies to identifying with the interests of humanity as a whole. The shift is already underway, but we can accelerate it by sharing two key ideas, interconnectedness and universal love. So we'll look for, first to interconnectedness. Interconnectedness or interdependence is the recognition that our fates are genuinely intertwined. No man is an island, we cannot survive alone, and all of our actions affect one another. The mind can grasp this intellectually by zooming out on some of the systems in which we participate. So consider our food system. You know, the rays of the sun come down and are transformed by plants. And those plants are then picked by farmers. The farmers also have to be fed. And the plants then go onto trucks, which use gasoline, which comes from a process involving earlier dead plants. And once delivered, the plants are converted by us into human body, which can eventually be composted and turned into an area for more plants to grow. So note that we are literally what we eat. We are literally the rays of the sun gradually converted into this very sophisticated form. Or look at Earth's climate system. You know, the weather out your window each day can seem random, but if you zoom out, large cloud formations are moving great distances, which is what's causing rain or shine at each location. And so whether it's our climate, our shared health, global supply chains, the internet, or communities formed by friends coming to depend on each other, from the interconnectedness of individuals emerge systems that are more than the sum of their parts. In fact, the whole of reality is really one interconnected system with everything hanging in relation to every other thing. Some describe this as we're all one, and that's true. It's equally true that we're all different. We are the forest, and we are the trees. And, and once I saw this, I saw that it's actually in our long-term self-interest to work together. Because when parts of a system work against the system for their own gain, they ironically do worse than if they'd collaborated. So, you know, take cancer. At first, consume all the resources and multiply seems like a great strategy for a cell. But this kills off their environment, the human, and cancer cells ironically die sooner than they would have if they had each contributed to their larger environment in their particular way, whether as matter in the brain or skin in a toe. And so interconnectedness ties our fates, and this is this first motivation for this radical shift from me to we. But there's a second motivation that would make me take care of someone even if I had nothing to gain. 
and that's love. Have you ever been in love? It's not so much that you become one with your partner as that you move the focus of your attention from taking care of you to taking care of both of you. And then maybe later a whole family of yous. Universal love is like that, but for a whole planet of yous. Let's pause and try something together. So I invite you to take a moment and close your eyes. Take a deep breath, start to come into your body. And let's each imagine the people we love most dearly. So maybe it's a significant other or best friend, or grandparent. See them in your mind, but also start to feel that love in your heart. Imagine giving them a big hug and experience what happens naturally arising in your chest, maybe your throat. Smile at them. Keep breathing and open your eyes just a little and start to look at the people sitting next to you. You don't have to interact, but just quietly, even if you don't know them, cherish them. See what it feels like to want to take care of them. To want to take care of each other. This is actually a game you can play waiting at the bus stop. Just <laughs> look around at different people and cherish them, but it is awkward when you get caught. But through practice, I've come to regard the welfare of others much as I regard my own. I remember the moment that I first got it. A couple years ago, I went camping with some friends. We stayed up all night dancing, hanging around the fire. Eventually, the sun was coming up, and my legs were starting to get tired. The ground was muddy, so I couldn't sit there. And so I looked around, and there were a few chairs, but only one was still empty. And I had this, this just sort of reflexive, normal thought of, oh, other people are sitting around that, they're standing around that chair. They're going to want to sit down in a second, too. I better grab that chair before someone else does. And in that moment, all of a sudden, I just I saw that thought as if from a distance. And I realized that it was optional. There was nothing particularly special about my desire to sit in that chair. Other people would enjoy it just as much. And in that one moment, everything felt different. I just, I felt lighter. My chest felt brighter. I had this like spontaneous awakening. Like I could see the very fabric of the universe as love as though the force that was binding each electron to each proton was the same thing that I was experiencing at this much higher level of abstraction. In that moment, I saw the interest of the other as equivalent to my own. Einstein once said, man experiences himself as separate from the rest, an optical delusion of consciousness, a prison that restricts us to our own personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature. This perspective, which makes it seem obvious that we should all work together, comes quite naturally for humans in small tribes. But Einstein's task is much harder when globalization expands our tribe to seven billion people. But it is happening. When the tsunami hit in Asia or the earthquake in Haiti, international contributions poured in. Thanks to technology, people could see and even feel the suffering of those very far away from them, and even lend a hand. Since 2010, 200 of the world's billionaires have signed the Giving Pledge, a commitment to give away half their wealth in their lifetimes. I know some of them, and their desire to help the world is genuine. My business partner, Dustin, on his decision to put his money towards projects like fighting malaria in Africa, put it, it is much more relevant than I can relate to the suffering someone experiences when they are sick or hungry than that we look at the same mountains every day. 
with this attitude, giving is a receiving, and loving kindness becomes the path to happiness. In fact, research shows that giving money yields far more happiness than receiving money. After $75,000 a year, it's actually the only way for money to make you happier. After that, spending money on yourself just stops doing the trick. And so if giving makes us happy, and everyone wants to be happy, why is this so hard? For some people, it's just not realistic. If, if you haven't had your own basic needs sat satisfied, focusing on other people's needs is just not going to really be an option. But for those of us who are above the poverty line, I think it's just that day-to-day -day desires come up. I, I know I feel this every day. I, I feel something lacking. I try to acquire something to fill the void. And often it works for a good five minutes, but never longer than that. Every single time it fails. In my experience, the only times I actually feel sustained, real joy and flow are when I'm participating in something that's bigger than myself and contributing to its thriving. And so together, interconnectedness and love form the basis for the rapidly growing modern spirituality. It's an abstraction of all the old ones, leaving behind the dogma as well as any tension with truth and science. Of course, the core messages aren't new. Buddha considered interconnectedness or dependent arising his most profound insight. And teachers have been explaining universal love for millennia. But what is new is technology and the leverage that it gives us. Technology means that we can zoom out and for the first time in history can actually affect systems at a global scale. And this is scary when we do it mindlessly. But if we do it mindfully, the possibilities are beyond exciting. We, we in this room have a greater capacity to change the world than the kings and presidents of just 50 years ago. In the 21st century, interconnectedness and universal love are more than spiritual platitudes. They change how we think about the purpose and potential of all human systems. And so for the rest of the talk, let's look at four critical systems and how they change when the actors in those systems are concerned with we rather than me. Start with ecology. So the me perspective is that the earth is a supply house and a sewer to be mined for our benefit. And the results of this are everywhere. International droughts are already causing wild spikes in food prices. Food insecurity puts risk not only for famine but for war. Estimates are that rising sea levels will displace 150 million people from their homes in the next 40 years. Our systems are so interconnected that it's hard to predict how changes will affect them. For example, half of British Columbia's pine trees were mysteriously destroyed in the last 10 years. They eventually figured out it's because it's no longer getting cold enough in winter to kill off the native pine beetle that feeds on them. And so now there's this mass infestation. And this really demonstrates how we just never know when we'll hit unforeseen tipping points that will spiral out of control. And so as we proceed, we're just ever more vulnerable to total systems collapse. The we perspective acknowledges that the fate of humanity is inextricably bound with the fate of our environment. The science is complex, and no one knows whether it'll be 300 years or 30 years, but regardless of where the cliff is, we're driving toward it fast. Shouldn't climate change be a top-of-mind concern for every educated person? We are making strides. Electric car sales soared in 2012. Germany's use of solar power rose 50% in just the last nine months. Nuclear power companies like TerraPower are developing fourth-generation reactors that are safer and more efficient. Consumers are succeeding in pushing companies like Coca-Cola into developing more sustainable resource management systems. And biochar is really exciting. I only learned about this recently. It's a way to convert waste into energy with negative carbon emissions. But we're, we're at the very beginning. How might your talents be applied, even if indirectly, to what is surely one of the most important problems on the globe today? Make society sustainable so our grandchildren can be born into a healthy world will require zooming out and waking up to the fact that we are one ecosystem, that the trees are our externalized lungs. Start from ecology to nations. In the me perspective, you pledge allegiance to your country against all others. Both presidential candidates last year talked about bringing jobs to America, even if two Indian jobs would have to be sacrificed to create one American job. But why does it matter whether the person's on this landmass or that landmass? The we perspective zooms out and sees our common ancestry. 
it sees us becoming increasingly interdependent thanks to policies like open immigration and global trade, with many countries already having become so specialized that they could not survive if trade were cut off tomorrow. It sees that we are one people and that all war is civil war. The me perspective is that a business is a vehicle for creating profit, which they maximize at all costs, even if it requires arbitrage or confusing people into taking loans they can't pay back or advertising that manipulates people unconsciously. It defines the goal of money as improving the lifestyle of oneself and one's family. The we perspective is that a business is just a group of people who've come together in this shared identity to improve the world through their effort. The corporation can be a powerful vehicle for positive impact. In fact, more companies are starting explicitly as social enterprises or for-benefit corporations. Coursera is helping anyone in the world with an internet connection get a first-class education. Method is driving innovation in supply chains to create green consumer home products. Sungevity and SolarCity, already a $1.3 billion public company, are using innovations in finance and global satellite photography to provide zero money down solar paneling. You know, business is far from a zero-sum game. At the end of the day, the competition is not other business. It's suffering. This is how we run Asana. Dustin and I are 100% philanthropically motivated. We don't want more personal money, but building this product is the highest leverage way that we know how of benefiting our fellow man. Being a for-profit corporation allows us to hire the best people and give them enough resources so they can focus on their work without distraction. Money is the means rather than the ends. You know, capitalism gets a bad rap, and often rightly so, but it can be a beautifully efficient system for collaborative resource allocation. Basically, everyone gets a certain number of votes, called currency, based on how much value they've contributed so far, and you use those votes to decide which project should be allocated more resources to expand their scope. The market is this constant flow of all of us microfunding each other. Louis C.K. has this great quote. I never viewed money as being my money. I always saw it as the money. It's a resource. If it pulls up around me, it needs to be flushed back out into the system. <laughs> as customers, we choose which projects to fund based not only on our needs, but on our values. I mean, imagine if rather than vilifying them, everyone cared deeply about corporations and their effectiveness because each one was contributing something to our thriving. If you zoom out and squint hard enough, we're effectively one company, Earth Inc., as Al Gore called it. We're increasingly seeing this, especially in technology. Open source, APIs, cross-pollination of employees, better business-to-business -business collaboration tools. The lines that we draw between companies are becoming ever less meaningful. And from a user's perspective, the web is already just one big product, even if different portions happen to have different logos in the upper left corner. Yet even in the technology industry, I meet people with wildly different motivations. The me perspective says you start a company to sell or IPO. Even with good intentions, the quest for page views can lead to unintentionally destructive products. Social games can produce brain chemicals and behavior patterns identical to gambling and addictive drugs. Smartphones, which not that long ago we were calling crackberries, can create these cycles of twitching for new notifications at the expense of real human connection. When these technologies yield hockey stick growth curves, it's rare that technologists stop and ask whether the world that we're creating is one we actually want to live in, whether these technologies are humane. The we perspective sees technology as leverage and design applied to impediments to human thriving. You start a company to solve an important problem in a way that no one else is effectively solving it. Futurist Barbara Marx Hubbard talks about this in terms of conscious evolution. I mean, you know, take a look at your thumbs. It took millions of years to evolve these thumbs through random mutation. But now, we can boldly choose the direction of our species development. Fortunately, the Wii perspective is growing. I know Larry and Sergey, Google's founders, are very earnest about don't be evil. More recently, Nation Builder is helping communities to get organized and take action. Kickstarter is helping more creative work come into the world. Lyft is trying to decimate the number of cars on the road through ride sharing. And Quora is helping share the world's knowledge. And while often misunderstood, I believe one of the most powerful examples of technology being designed for positive social good is Facebook. 
Facebook is a tool that lays bare and harnesses our interconnectedness and sometimes our love. My friend and former State Department official Jared Cohen reports that Facebook's mere existence has done more to create avenues for engagement between Arabs and Israelis than 30 years of coordinated effort by governments and NGOs. <laughs> Facebook allows young Arabs and young Israelis to literally see each other's faces, to witness their interconnectedness, and thereby find a common humanity. Facebook's mission is to make the world more open and connected. Connected is about interconnectedness, and open is about transparency, but it's also about opening our hearts. Facebook's effects aren't all good, but they are trying. While working there, I never once heard someone talk about getting rich. Instead, we asked, how much value can we add to the world? Mark Zuckerberg wrote in their IPO filing, we don't build services to make money, we make money to build better services. Mark thinks at a systemic level. He makes product decisions in terms of how they'll affect interconnections and ne the network as a whole, as much as how they'll affect individual users. And VP of product Chris Cox studied Buddhist thought in Bhutan, the country famous for measuring gross national happiness instead of gross domestic product, and applies these learnings in his work. I think the story of the like button is a great example of these ideas in action. It came from me looking at Facebook as a larger system and seeing people transmitting these little bits of affirmation through wall posts and comments. And we asked, what's the minimum effort required to transmit love between nodes and thereby enable more love to flow through this interconnected system? We almost made the thumbs up icon be a heart. And that's why there's no dislike button, despite it being literally Facebook's number one most requested feature. <laughs> We're designing the social graph to create positive feedback loops of love, not negativity. Designing a world in which people uplift each other rather than tear each other down. We are one social graph with relationships spanning all national and cultural boundaries. And the last part of technology we'll look at is communication. Communication technologies enable us to harness interconnectedness and coordinate collective action. Asana's vision takes this to the extreme. What if all groups of humans, from Fortune 500 companies to small groups of thoughtful, committed citizens, could coordinate as effortlessly as the limbs of my body coordinate? Asana does this by building software environments that synchronize everyone's knowledge. We think of them as team brains. People are using these team brains today to coordinate incredible projects, some which just weren't possible before. Emerald Therapeutics was started by two of the world's top bioscientists with a really bold mission, not just to cure cancer, but to end all disease. It's this massive project involving researchers with various specialties, all passing data off to each other. And after growing the team, the founders found that they had stopped doing science altogether and were devoting 100% of their time to management. But after they adopted Asana, they found they got 75% of that time back to doing science and the whole lab got vastly more efficient as well. Naya Health provides healthcare to Nepal's rural poor. It's this complex operation involving hundreds of volunteers over two continents. They describe the impact of Asana in terms of the quantity and the quality of the healthcare they could provide as mind-blowing. Their CEO actually showed me recently how they use Asana for everything from funding projects to making sure that patients get to the right hospital. And when a patient's record is more complete, that means that they're cured. And so as the cost of human coordination approaches zero, imagine what we can accomplish together. The climax of communication technology and the mission of Asana is when all of humanity can coordinate its collective action seamlessly without effort. Interconnectedness manifested. We are one project, the human project for global thriving, one team. This is the arc of history, from the local tribe to the global tribe, the arc toward more collaboration, cooperation, and trust, of which Homo sapiens is uniquely capable. What will happen when all of humanity engages in the one project? I mean, imagine a world of abundance where everyone has the resources they need, empowered to contribute their unique gifts to the world. Imagine us in harmony with each other, in harmony with nature, redirecting efforts that are wasted on defense to exploring the limits of art and science and culture and consciousness. If we work together on the planet, we will thrive in joy. It just requires us coming together toward a common vision for a thriving, sustainable humanity. Finally, zooming back in, what's the role of the me in the we? 
I believe we are each cells in the body Earth. We each choose whether to work as healthy, contributing cells or to be cancerous. We're not morally obligated to contribute, but it is in our interests and ultimately is even more fun. I believe true, sustained personal happiness requires being in harmony with one's systems. To find that harmony is to find a role that fits each of us in this human project for global thriving, our calling. slide. <laughs> Thanks to technology, we in this room can have a huge impact on the whole system if we work together. The majority of humans do not yet have this opportunity. We are in a tiny minority who've been dealt such great economic, educational, and biological hands. For each of us, our opportunity will be different. My brother Perry consults for politicians with integrity. My housemate John sells rooftop panels for longevity. My friend Johnny is making music that's starting to inspire the world to remember how worth fighting for life is. But whatever your role, I believe it is no longer sufficient to talk about love or even to feel love. Those of us fortunate enough to be at the top of the hierarchy of needs must work for love, fight for love in the most impassioned and leveraged ways that we know how. Technologists, influencers, and leaders have the unprecedented opportunity to become experts in the systems in which we participate and not only fix them, but design them. We are the ones driving this bus. As you reflect on your deepest values, remember that life is short, youth is finite, and opportunities endless. Have you found the intersection of your passion and the potential for world-shaping positive impact? Because work matters. Let's not lose the fire we started with, especially if you're going to devote the best years of your life to your work. I hope you find something that matters to you deeply and to the world. No one knows whether we and our teammates will realize our audacious visions, but in order to do great things, we must attempt great things together. I love you all. Thank you. To voice, to voice your commitment in engaging and committing to this human project for global thriving, feel free to sign up at oneproject.org. Let's support each other in this vital shared mission. Thank you.